Yeah, you see that? Okay. <clears throat> um, so, well, thank you, Caroline and Rory, for inviting me. Um, yeah, I'm delighted to come talk about this because it's one of my, it's my hobby really now. Um, my wildflower meadow and bees and everything associated with it. That picture you can see, by the way, is a early prototype tracking device that we invented at Bangor um, that doesn't use a battery, so it's much lighter than anything that's been used before. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, it's a bit geeky, what have you. Um, but yeah, just thought I'd put that up as an image. Um, so what I'm going to talk about really is you, I assume, have sown or are about to sow a wildflower meadow. And whilst your focus is on um, the, uh, the diversity of flowering plants and the sort of joy that brings through you know, their beauty and what have you, the shape of the meadow, um, there is also a free lunch that goes with this in terms of the pollinators and other insects that you are going to, without any effort at all, attract to um, your wildflower meadows. As Caroline mentioned, there is a sort of doom and gloom component of this. I think it's my own DNA that is doom and gloom. But I want to <clears throat> make um, as strong, strong a case as I can for why what you're doing now is, is going to save the world in terms of insects. Um, because there are a lot of worrying things and trends that have happened in the past 70 years, but certainly in the last 30 years, it seems to have accelerated. So the first half and a bit just over half of this is about pollinator losses and drivers. Um, and I want to provide, present some of the science um, that has evaluated the, to what extent we've lost our pollinators. And then the second part of this is about um, what you might hope to see pretty quickly um, in any wildflower meadow. And as Caroline said, please feel free to um, ask questions as we go along, if you wish. So this is a bit of a personal story <clears throat> as to why I took up beekeeping in 2006, because I'd intended to do it in 1986 when I was 22 years old. Um, but this is pre-internet time. And whilst I got given the book for Christmas of how to do beekeeping, um, I had no idea where beekeepers lived or occurred. So I never actually got in touch with beekeepers. And back in the day there, it required a letter that you would write to the beekeeping association if you got their address and then waiting for a response maybe. So it got postponed for 20 years. And 2006, the reason I suddenly became re-engaged on this is that there were reports coming out of the United States of massive bee colony losses. And what was unique about this particular um, type of loss was that beekeepers, and some of these beekeepers, the commercial beekeepers, they you know, own and manage up, up to about 4,000 colonies. And they use these to deliver ecosystem services to crops um, across the United States. And they were going to their bees, inspecting them um, in early February before they took them to California. And then going back two days later, and 75% to 90% of those colonies had disappeared. And when I say disappeared, is that all the bees, bar um, a handful inside and the queen, were, were no longer present. Um, it was quickly called the Mary Celeste syndrome because, as you can see from this figure here, this frame, hopefully you can see my cursor. What you have here is um, honey stores, okay, capped honey stores. You have brood bee brood here, so these are young larvae that are going to emerge as bees shortly, and pollen around here to feed the bees. And I've circled the queen, and then you can see scattered on this um, frame up to about 50 nurse bees. Now normally that hive would have about 40,000 bees inside it, and this one had 50, and that's what a lot of the beekeepers in the US were finding, and nobody could explain it. And uh, it very quickly led to a range of um, images appearing on the internet because the public became quickly concerned about this um, and I was personally disbelieving that we actually had the ability to eradicate a species like honeybee because it seems to be so, so pervasive in um, all locations around the globe bar the Arctic and the Antarctic and this is the early days of the internet proper you know, you know, proper functioning thing that you could just type in a word to google and you would get what you were looking for. Um, and very quickly, we were seeing images like this, and this is with bees, 
and this is without bees to give uh, you an idea of the sort of things that will immediately disappear without honeybee pollination. And it's not ju just a direct um, fruits and vegetables, it was also the byproducts of that, so additives to um, lots of dairy products. So this is with bees and this is without bees. Um, and this obviously struck a chord with the uh, wider public who had never before been particularly concerned about the plight of um, insects and particularly the honeybee. And who would have thought that we would have moved from CND and peace um, symbols uh, as graffiti on walls to things like this. So there was a, a sea change in the public perception of the importance of insects, and that was great. Okay, so there is a, there's an upside to colony collapse disorder. Um, so the public became engaged in this and suddenly the symbol of Manchester, which is the uh, honeybee because of industrial working, um, came to the fore and people of Manchester became really proud of the fact they had this as their symbol. So there was a cultural shift took place almost overnight and I was part of that and rather arrogantly and naively decided that I needed to save the planet and I would keep some bees. Um, one of the reasons why we haven't been concerned about this decline in insects over the last 70 years is that it's really difficult to visualise. You can easily note that there are no longer swallows nesting in your barn or um, in houses around you. Um, that would be a very easy thing to um, notice in, in any given summer. But losing insects um, is really difficult to actually visualise it. So I'm going to give you um, this as an image. So imagine this was my father's vehicle, which it wasn't. Back in the 1970s, we used to travel down to, I used to live in Guildford in Surrey. We would travel to the um, south coast on the three hot days of summer we got. Um, nowadays, it's three days of rain in the summer. And from start to finish, it was a round trip of about 90 miles and the windscreen would look like this. And those big flats are probably bumblebees and dragonflies. But your windscreen would have been guaranteed to be covered in these flats. Um, and the tradition was that on Sundays, the dads, and it was typically dads, would put their car in the garage because everybody had just one car. And they would set to work cleaning the windscreen so that they could proudly drive to work on Monday morning. Now, um, the automobile industry uh, clocked this pretty quickly and, were, and developed these things which were known as insect deflectors. So this is a much more contemporary version, but basically what the first insect deflectors were, were a piece of rubber that you would stick on the bonnet here, a triangular piece of rubber. And the argument that was made was this would create some turbulence and it would deflect the insects up and over the windscreen. It didn't work, but everybody bought into the idea. Uh, and more recently, to give you an idea, that this, uh, this notion of windscreen splats persists is you can have these fancy front spoilers put on um, whose purpose is once again to just deflect um, the insects up and over your windscreen. So it, there's a commercial sort of um, aspect to this and if business is developing these things then there's obviously a demand for it and I think it's a slightly misplaced demand. But related to that, RSPB in 2004 were concerned that the number of insectivorous birds, so birds whose diet is primarily insects, seem to be declining and one of the theories they had was that the food resources for these birds was also declining. So they carried out um, this survey um, across the UK using this grid that you can see in front of the number plate and basically what you would do is you'd clean your number plate on Sunday, drive for a week, record your mileage and then count the splats and you would send that to RSPB. Um, so it's nationwide 40,000 people um, yeah, I, I could ask this question. How far do you think back in 2004 you had to drive before you hit an insect? Any offers? Shout out. The right answer gets £15,000 cash. Wow, that would make a lot of meadows. Come on, speak to somebody. You record that, Rory. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, before anyone drives me to bankruptcy, it was five miles um, before you got your first splat. Now, 2004, I'm going to demonstrate in a moment, was uh, by that time we had removed most of the iceberg. If you picture insect 
abundance in terms of an iceberg, most of the stuff below sea level had already disappeared. And what we're left with in 2004 is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so we have a very small insect community by 2004, and I'll provide a range of reasons for that. And yet even then, you know, even in 2004, we had to drive five miles before we hit anything. And I am guessing that that actually has declined even further today. Um, and the Wildlife Trust last week released, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, they released an app that you can now use um, to record splats on your number plate. Um, so yeah, you may want to download that. So yeah, five miles. So that's a bit anecdotal. It's not a robust study by the RSPB, but a robust study was carried out in Denmark. And that, that splatometer, if you like, was used for over a 22 year period. And the research of this uh, Muller um, was looking to see, look at the relationship between flying insect biomass um, in terms of number of splats, and whether that there was a correlation, a relationship with the um, number of insectivorous birds in the same region. So he basically had the same car and he drove it up and down the same piece of road on the same days at the same times um, over 22 years and recorded splats on the number plate. Um, let me just, I'll just hide this. Yeah. Um, and in that time, he recorded a substantial decline of 80% uh, decrease in the number of splats he got from 1997 to 2017. Now, if you think that 1997 was the tip of the iceberg around then, what we're looking at is the tip of the iceberg has been reduced by a further 80% in that time. So he plotted this uh, to show that there was a decline, but he also plotted um, relationships between uh, barn swallows, so swallows and um, insect abundance. So what this graph shows you on the left is very low insect abundance and how many breeding pairs there were in the region, so somewhere around 120 maybe. Um, and the more insects you had, so some of these years had really high insect abundance, there was a relationship with the number of nesting uh, and breeding pairs that um, made it through and juveniles that made it through to adulthood. So you, you tended to get more breeding pairs in years with high insect abundance compared to low insect abundance. So that's quite obvious really, but as the trend has been downhill, we've also seen a decline in the number of barn swallows. And this also applies for house martins and for the sort of much rarer uh, sand martin. Uh, but a really strong relationship between insect abundance and the success of breeding pairs of sand martins. So that was a bit more conclusive, just in terms of what's flying around and why we are or aren't seeing more insects now uh, than we did before. It doesn't explain what's caused this decline. And then another study in Germany, again in 2017. So they'd done this over 27 years and they had only recorded flying insects in German nature reserves. So these places are designed for things like flying insects. Um, so they don't do well here, they're not gonna do well anywhere. And they use this thing called a malaise trap in the photo on the right, and it works like a tent and basically the insect flies towards this netting and if it arrives from the right direction, it will enter that netting and then won't be able to find its way out necessarily. And it'll just like, um, if you go camping in the tent, if you leave the door open for the day, you'll find loads of insects collected at the top of the tent. This uses the same principle, only it captures all of the insects um, in the top of that tent, um, kills them, and the scientists then measured the weight of those insects collected on a daily basis over 27 summers in Germany. And they recorded um, a 75% decline in flying insect biomass. So this sort of correlates um, with the study of Muller and the insect splats. And again, it's a further, you know, it's a robust study because there's 63 different sites, so there's lots of variability. Um, which is always important for assessing these things. And I want to show you these graphs of what happened in that time. So the graph on the left is recording the number of grams per day of insect biomass, so how much they weighed, these insects that they collected. 
And you can see on the left hand side here, uh, these blue bars indicate 1990. And as they move to orange, that's just showing you the year in which they did it. So orange at the end there is 2016. Blue here on the left uh, is 1990. And in 1990, the average amount was about nine to 10 grams per day of insect biomass across 63 nature reserves. We get to 2016, and the average here, if you want to trace that across horizontally, is about one and a half grams of flying insects per day. Graph on the right is exactly the same data, but it's showing you these changes by month. So if you look at July and August, when you expect to see most insects, we have one dot at the top there, um, which is, because it's blue, means it's one of the early, earlier years of study. Um, but that's over 20 grams a day of insect biomass. And we track that down, by the time we get to the last um, dot for that month recorded, um, we see we're getting about three quarters of a gram per day. So they also recorded massive changes in the number of um, insects flying uh, since 1990. Okay, so I want to hypothesize some of the drivers of this change. And the first, uh, the second one I'm going to look at, but I'll briefly show it first, is uh, pesticides and specifically neonicotinoid pesticides. And the second one is land use change, and I'll start with that now. So apparently there's an arable farmer here. So if you're even vaguely as old as me, you might remember this uh, scene. Um, so this is a typical piece of uh, downland um, wheat field back in the early 80s, late 70s. And in Surrey and Hampshire, um, it was a feature of Sunday afternoon drives in the summer would be to go out and look at these poppies that sprung up in all of these uh, wheat fields. And there was also you know, a mediocre diversity of other weed plants in amongst that crop. Um, if you go back to when my grandfather was a boy and he lived in Ricelip, which was actually not part of London back in 19, whenever, 20, when he was a young man, um, they had this rotational cropping. So you, uh, and one of the, uh, one in every four fields was left to go farrow for a year so the soils would replenish. And there were lots of arable weeds associated with these fields. And these are weeds now that are very rare, called marigolds, um, for instance. Um, uh, what's the blue one? Cool, no, corn cockles, and there's a, I forgot, the, oh, corn flowers. Um, so lots of, flowers that were associated with this sort of rotational cropping, but they've also uh, become quite rare because we've moved to a different system. So there was a, a change in land use, and I think this um, image at the bottom is one that you're probably quite familiar with. So that yellow oilseed rape is very good for honeybee um, keepers who will take their bees there um, to collect the nectar from that crop but it's not particularly good for anything else before or after because of growth regulator usage in many of these fields. So you've got crop grows the same high and it, makes, um, it allows economies and efficiencies in terms of harvesting the crop. But there's not much else growing in there apart from these residual hedgerows they have around these fields. And many of those in the last 50, 60, 70 years have also been removed. So all the time we're removing this um, resource for insects and pollinators. So land use change is one, uh, and the other associated with this is neonicotinoids, which I'd like to talk about. This is what they look like. Um, these were a miracle solution uh, back in the early 90s. Um, and basically what was done was that the seed of the crop you were going to sow was coated in neonicotinoid. And because it's a systemic uh, pesticide, the plant, as it germinated, would suck up this pesticide and incorporate it into its own um, plant tissue so that any um, target pest species like a weevil or a aphid that bit it through the outer layer of the plant would suck down a lethal dose. So this was amazing because what the farmer could do was to drill this um, into his or her field 
um, and basically cover it over, walk away, come back and harvest the crop three months later. And in terms of defending the crop, defending itself against um, pests, um, it was, you know, fully armed because it's a really powerful um, substance and that in a sense is to its advantage because you don't need to use much for it to do the job. But they are uh, toxic to insects in absolutely mind-blowingly small quantities. So the lethal dose required to kill half a sample of an insect, they have to do these tests before these are released and given approval. And to measure its toxicity, one of the tests is this lethal dose to kill half a sample in a laboratory, and they do it on honeybees as well. And for honeybees, it was five nanograms. So that's five um, in a billion parts, okay? So yeah, one gram is a billion nanograms. I've got a picture, I don't know if you can see me actually, which you can't. But imagine a tea bag, you're, that tea bag you're looking at there, um, the tea inside the bag weighs a gram and the bag and that piece of cardboard on the string weighs another gram. So all we're talking about is the tea in the sachet as an equivalent weight, okay? So one gram of clothianidin um, is enough to, and this was a rough calculation, I must admit, but it, it's got the um, ability to kill, if administered individually to bees, about 250 million um, honeybees. So, Welsh beekeeping uh, members manage about 288 million bees based on four to five colonies per beekeeper. So with just the tea in that sachet, we could almost eradicate the honeybees in Wales. If we look at the UK, 44,000 beekeepers, 274,000 colonies, that's 9.6 billion bees, then you need 19 grams to kill all of those, and 19 grams is this AA battery up to the top of the black component, okay? So again, you don't need much, but if you could administer it to each and every bee, you could um, kill outright 9.6 billion bees. So it's huge numbers. Um, in 2010, globally, we used 20,000 metric tons of neonicotinoid. That's this many grams, and these numbers are about to get big. That's enough to kill this many bees. That's quite a meaningless number for many people. It looks like that, which is that, and this was a new number for me. So this is 5,000 quadrillion bees. So a quadrillion is a thousand trillion, and this is 5,000 thousand trillion bees. Okay, how much is that? Well, it's that many hives, okay? And that would be enough to populate one and a half million planets. And we've only discovered 1,700 planets um, so far. So we've got a long way to go. This is just mind blowing potential um, to kill honeybees. And yet, Dave Goulson, the bumblebee guru, uh, rightly said that um, field realistic exposure, so bees visiting oilseed rape, for instance, um, in the field that have neonicotinoid in their tissue, um, bees are unlikely to be uh, to die as a direct consequence of ingesting those low doses of neonicotinoid. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this. Um, it doesn't kill them outright, but it has these detrimental impacts on each and every one. And so Goulson uh, became well known for his work on bumblebees and what he was finding was the colonies of bumblebees near these fields that had neonicotinoids in them tended to produce fewer workers, fewer queens, and that this would go from year to year. So you would see an ever diminishing number of uh, bumblebee, bumblebees um, near to these systems. But more disturbing, I feel, because you know, we basically banned the use of neonicotinoids um, when we were in Europe, and it's um, a ban that's persisting at the moment. Uh, now that we're out of Europe. But what was more worrying, I felt, was this. So they measured the um, volume or weight of neonicotinoid brought back to um, beehives uh, whilst the crop was in flower. And they found that it was this 72 nanograms, okay, so 72 out of a billion grams, uh, nanograms um, per day. Um, so quite low doses, but these were fed to larvae and they're more vulnerable and they will have a lower 
LD50 score. But what was incredible was that this neonicotinoid was still going into the hive when the crop had been harvested. And it was that that started raising eyebrows. You know, what's going on? If the crop's gone, how can there still be neonicotinoid um, being brought in by the bees? Well, the reason is that about 5% of the um, neonicotinoid on those seeds is taken up by the plant. 1% we think is um, blown away by the wind as it's sown in the drills. And about 94% of the pesticide um, moves laterally and vertically through the soil. So it flows through the soil, if you like, out to the filled margins. And at these filled margins, we have done things like incentivize farmers to um, sow uh, pollinator friendly wildflower strips. And many of these wildflower strips, if they were planted next to a oilseed rape or even a wheat field, would have also ingested um, or taken up uh, neonicotinoid. And the same goes for our hedgerows that have hawthorn, um, blackthorn, and all the flowers in the spring uh, from that. And they also have these um, pesticides incorporated into their plant tissue. So that was the worrying thing. There's something ironic about. English Nature or Natural Resources Wales uh, funding schemes to plant wildflower strips. And I'm not knocking wildflower strips, I think they're a great idea, but to attract pollinators to them uh, to sort of subsequently kill them because of the pesticide that have made its way laterally through these fields. So that is the um, bad news. Uh, there is good news, um, and you're part of it. I don't know if this is a moment to maybe answer some questions? Um, I have a couple of questions from Anne. I don't know, Anne, if you want to unmute yourself, you're probably best, you're better place to ask them. Hello, I think, are you meaning me? Yes. Right, no. uh, yes, um, I unfortunately have, um, uh, my vet, uh, supplied me in the past with some, um, or she has, yeah, she's supplied me with a neonicotinoid to deal with a mite problem on some animals which I have. Um, so I'm, I've been very concerned about using that. In I've used it carefully, but even so, it's on the bodies of these creatures, and I don't know whether there's enough of it going off onto the pasture. But normally speaking, on my very tiny bit of ground that we have. We don't use any, we haven't used any noxious substances for at least 15 years. And the other, the other, I think I had another question about um, glyphosate because we've got 12 hives on a local farm, maybe 13, but anyway, 12 hives. And he uses glyphosate along his, um, uh, the strips of trees that he has there. So it's a um, cider apple farm. And, um, you know, obviously, uh, but that's, I know that's divert, di Diverting your attention from neonix to glyphosate, but I just those are the two questions I asked. So I'm just really wanting your comments, really. Okay. Um, so my comment on the front line, I know Dave Gawson's mentioned this as well. I, I mean, I personally don't think that is going to have a substantial impact on what's going on in your meadow. Um, okay. I don't know. Uh, just because of the quantities and how it's dispersed, anyway, it's not likely to be evenly dispersed through your meadow. No, and it's very targeted, mm. just on what's, the legs, basically, so on the bodies. Mm. Okay, thank what's you. What's bad if, the, if, that, the, that if the dogs jump into the watercourse? Is that an issue if yes. the dog goes uh, for a swim? It, it could be. Um, I, 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 yeah, I can't comment because I just don't know. Um, no, fair enough. I, I'd only be guessing on that. And the glyphosate one, there, I have seen a paper, but I can't remember the full outcome of it, but it was published because it they're only ever published really when they find detrimental impacts. Um, but they did find a relationship between the use of glyphosate and impact on insects. But what's interesting about glyphosate, um, and well, that's, a, that's a herbicide, but also fungicides, um, that they have shown that the, some of these act as a catalyst if they're in the presence of neonicotinoids. There's a problem in the States, because they, you know, they continue as before, and I think in Australia, but it acts as a catalyst. So that five nanograms as the LD50 as a measure of the toxicity 
to kill a bee, that drops to about two nanograms if it's in the presence of certain um, uh, fungicides or, and I think herbicides, but I'm not sure. But yeah, um, Thank I you. have a comment beyond that, but there is a paper, Anne, and I can find it and forward it to Caroline, who can forward it to you if you like. That's, that's extremely kind. Thank you very much. All right. Thank Anne, you the one who I saw sitting outside. Yes. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> what a great way to listen to a talk. Anyway. <laughs> it um, is. Yeah. Okay, so being the change. So as I said at the beginning, this is a free lunch. You know, the fact that you have sown a wild flower meadow, you are going to provide um, so many homes and food uh, resources for things you've never imagined existed, I'm guessing. And I want to just talk about some of the things you might typically... Um, what is this? Can't seem to... I might have to... There. Okay. So yeah, things you could expect from a flower meadow. So I'm going to talk about a thing called drift fencing. Um, and then bit briefly go through some of the commoner things that you could expect to see in you know, a fairly short space of time, um, all the way down there. And also about the three-dimensional habitat structure of a flower meadow that Present, prevent, um, provide something over and above just species diversity. It provides this architectural structure that some species require. Uh, and then toward the end, quickly um, go over some of the monitoring if you're interested in carrying it out. But there's someone from Bug Life here who would probably be much better qualified than me um, about that. But if I can remember, I'll talk about these trophic cascades as well. Okay, so when I first started my meadow, um, yeah, I think somewhere between six and eight years ago, I can't remember. Um, one of the, I set myself an outcome indicator, which I had no control over really, um, but I, it was an indicator to me that I would have succeeded to an extent when I heard the chirping of my first grasshopper. And I think that took about three years before that happened. I mean, you can't really control when and how these things arrive in your meadow, but arrive they will. Um, so yeah, that was the first one for me. I have got another one in relation to insects now, but I can't remember what it was, it'll come to me. So I think it's a good incentive actually, you know, something you would like to see that is, you know, plausible um, as a way of monitoring non-plant diversity. So which insects would you like to see turn up that should turn up? Um, and you can just sort of, yeah, each year see if, any, if your target species has arrived. So this drift, drift fencing, the first thing you do when you, I live in what is a very improved grassland sort of agricultural system here on Anglesey. Uh, it's grazed with cattle mainly and some sheep. Um, but there really isn't much in terms of wildflowers. There's the hedgerows down the sides of roads, but it's pretty limited. So my one acre patch stands out like a beacon to anything that is flying through. And in only my second year, um, in about June, I had these, this migrant butterfly called the clouded yellow, which is found in northern France, but doesn't, uh, maybe it does now, but typically has never managed to survive in the UK over winter. And I think that turned up because it was just migrating north, flying over and saw what was below it and flew down and it stayed. Um, and it stayed for a couple of weeks. And I imagine it then just died of old age because they live about three or four weeks um, if they don't get predated. So your meadows will act as this drift fencing. And this drift fencing here that you can see is, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, is these are often put in when there are road improvement schemes um, that are gonna start. And these fences are there to capture any um, things like crested newts, um, other reptiles, they basically, as they move through the landscape, will come up against this barrier and then move down the side of it where they can be um, counted and recorded and then translocated. So your meadow has exactly the same, um, you know, has the same sort of function. It acts as drift fencing. And so just the fact that it's there will attract stuff that would have previously flown over if it had been a 
monocultural or just a fairly boring um, mown lawn. Uh, butterflies, so if you've got any damp patches in your meadow, you will get um, cuckoo flower will grow. And cuckoo flower is the food plant of the orange tip. Another food plant for this butterfly is uh, garlic mustard, which has leaves a bit like um, a sting nettle, but little white flowers. So either of these that appear in your meadow, you are likely to see um, orange tips. So this is a male and with butterflies, all the males are really attractive and all the females are not. So the female, instead of orange tips there, has black tips. Um, so you're likely to see these turn up quite quickly. They'll come and visit for nectar as well, but they might actually use your meadow as habitat. Um, this was another sort of target species for me, but this arrived really quickly. So I was disappointed in as much as there was no sense of anticipation. I said to myself, oh, I hope common blues turn up and lo and behold, they did. And they lay their eggs on bird's foot trefoil. So you have a substantial patch of that. The likelihood is that um, gravid or pregnant females will lay their eggs on that. Um, and that's, you know, I wanted to see that. And the, these, you, know, you can see them in the evening, their head down, um, attached to grass stems as they roost. And they roost in the same place every night. So you can go and inspect them at dusk. Uh, so yeah, that was that. If you've got, um, oh, oh. next not dot sorrel. If you have sorrel in your meadow, that's the food plant of the um, small copper butterfly. So it's also in the blue family of butterflies. Um, that also should appear pretty quickly in your meadow. Painted ladies, well, these you know, migrants, obviously. So the drift fence aspect of your meadow will attract these in and they'll feed on thistles at the end of the um, season. And knapweed is a good one for that. Uh, just grassy pasture, long grass, you will see that this butterfly, a meadow brown, flying, uh, females flying above the grass and they're just dropping eggs in as they go. And there are other brown uh, butterfly species. The wall is another one, the wall butterfly. Um, gatekeepers as well, uh, and skippers, so small skipper. I've got large skippers in here and small skippers at the moment. So all of these, without any effort, are likely to turn up um, in your meadow. Okay, so that's a free lunch there. And then there are moths, so you'll get these um, burnet moths, and there's a variety of those, but you typically get five or six spot burnet moths. Um, Cinnabar as well. Um, farmers might not like these in their paddock or horse um, riders because they lay their eggs on ragwort. Um, so you're prepared to leave ragwort in your field and there is no access to livestock. Then you will see the caterpillars, which are black and yellow um, in sort of July um, on ragwort. And then this one, mint moth, which is a little bit rarer, but you may see this. As its name suggests, lays its eggs on a mint and different members of, of that family of plants. <coughs> but that's also likely to turn up. So these are day flying mussel showing at the moment. And then at dusk, just as it gets almost too dark to see properly, you will see these white large moths um, flying like a ghost just above the uh, sward. Um, and this is a ghost moth. And again, that's an another. It's a spectacle to behold. Um, there are not thousands of them. The ones you see, they really do look like micro, uh, micros or ghosts flying through the, the meadow. So that's those. Um, hoverflies. Uh, now I'm not strong on hoverflies. I find really hard to differentiate between different uh, species. But things that are really striking to behold, pied hoverfly, you, you are likely to have these turn up. In your meadow. The long hoverfly, um, I think the name <laughs> explains why, um, but the interesting thing about both of those is that they feed on aphids that are found at the ground layer in your sward. So you've, you're starting to get this sort of trophic cascade of different hierarchies of um, insects in the sward. So you've got this interaction and this ecosystem, self-contained ecosystem, that is starting to, to develop where 
species A eats species B and species B eats species C. And that, that those relationships appear you know, quite quickly. And that can be quite exciting, as can these. So these are hoverflies, um, which look very much like bumblebees. Um, so the one on the left there looks like a white-tailed bumblebee. And there's the actual bumblebee. And the one, next one, the hoverfly, um, Im imitates the red-tailed bumblebee, and they have the red-tailed bumblebee on the far right. So these also start turning up, because if you've got red bumblebees in your meadow, there's a chance for the red bumblebee um, hoverfly mimic um, to appear as well. And these lay their eggs um, near or in the nests of these uh, bumblebees and basically parasitize uh, bumblebees, which is all good, okay? Um, solitary bees, and there are loads of these, and I had a brief chat with Caroline before the talk about, again, about the, the arable farmer. I hope he's here, um, because you have concerns about your soil quality. So this is unexplored science, but we know that a lot of solitary bees mine um, 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 mining bees, and this is the ashy mining bee. And so you get these aggregations of little sand volcanoes or little volcanoes where they've burrowed into the top 10 centimeters of the soil. And we'd be really interested in um, measuring what that adds to the sort of dynamic structure of um, the top 10 centimeters in um, agricultural soils. And they may, you know, it allows water to percolate into the soil easier. And I don't know if there's this movement of nutrients, so uh, yeah, nutrient cycling going on. These are all unknown, but things that we're all interested at Bangor University in uh, studying. Um, this is Osmia, so this is the red mason bee. This will turn up very quickly there. They've just passed their peak here in Anglesey at the moment. Really distinctive, you know, bright orange um, in early May, um, and there can be hundreds and hundreds of these. Uh, and leaf cutter bees, which you may see. So typically the evidence for these is quite often if you've got roses in your garden, or wild roses particularly, or rambling roses, um, they cut a moon shape out of the leaf and carry that leaf back to their nest. And this is used to feed the larvae that they lay um, in their nest. Uh, and yes, it's a food stuff. And you can see that quite easily. Now you can certainly see the feeding signs of it. And then if you hang around where you've seen the feeding signs, you're likely to see the insect itself. And then going back to this idea of um, trophic cascades, hierarchies of prey and predator, this ruby-tailed wasp, which must be one of the most beautiful insects, which you will definitely see um, because it becomes quite common. Um, this will appear and it will appear because you've got uh, these red mason bees and it lays its eggs in the nests of solitary bees and other wasps. Um, so you get the mason bee, you'll get this ruby-tailed wasp. And I, I got that after about three years. Um, or I noticed it after about three years. So these are all things that may well turn up very quickly in your meadow, but you may just have overlooked them. They may already be there. Um, and then this idea of, so this is uh, a bit of my meadow uh, back in, this wasn't that long ago, I would say this is early April. And um, nothing had quite taken, uh, kicked off. I think there's some cow slips just up the back there. Um, but when it grows, so this is actually yesterday, and this is actually the work, I should have shown my best aspect and being proud of my flowers. This is just under a sycamore tree, so it's still got some pretty rough grass there. Um, but what's interesting about this is it provides this dynamic grassland or this structure, three-dimensional structure. And with these three-dimensional structures, it allows the introduction of um, a range of different spiders that require this architecture um, and a diversity of plants. And so you're likely to see this as well developing throughout the summer and um, from one year to the next, it should, the number of these spiders should increase and loads of other things as well. And those spiders can only exist because you've already got lots of prey um, available for them because all the prey is coming to visit the flower heads. So you get, you know, specialist spider species that mimic flower heads and sit on flower heads to catch stuff as it lands. All this is going on. Um, 
you may have cow slips and if you've got a decent number of cow slips uh, you if you're really fortunate you may eventually get something like this and i think if this network that caroline and the others are looking to develop establishes itself such that cow slips become abundant um, then we may see this shift of the duke and burgundy butterfly from uh, central southern England um, a bit further west because I would have thought Herefordshire is you know, a prime target uh, for the movement of these rarer species. Um, so that's that's something in the meadow acting as a direct food uh, plant source for stuff that is going to colonise that habitat. So a lot of it is about you know, the pollinators visit because of the nectar availability but there'll be plants in there as well that are food plant of larvae of different species. Um, right, so I'll move on briefly to monitoring, but it sounds like there are a lot of specialised monitor, monitors than me um, here this evening. But if you're interested, you can look at um, butterfly transects. These are for much larger areas, I suppose. You should be able to monitor all the butterflies if you've got a one, two hectare patch. You should just be able to do that by walking around and observing sometime between 10 and 4 o'clock but you can do it at a larger scale and maybe incorporate that uh, your own medal within a longer walk these are just for your information i put these up here really um, bumblebee conservation they also have a bee survey and how to do it and counting the number of um, bumblebee nests that might be um, in your meadow it's quite uh, time consuming and hit and miss is my personal opinion of that. But if you really want to go the whole hog, you could do sweet netting for a start, where you would sweep the tops of the meadow, the grasses, you would be amazed the amount of things that you um, pick up in the bottom of that net that you can inspect if you've got a little tube of some sort to look at the insect through. Uh, and then obviously butterfly trapping, it's moved on, but I don't think the nets have changed very much um, in the intervening sort of 90, 100 years. Um, but again, you can use these butterfly nets as sweet netting um, to look at other stuff. So micro moths that are roosting on grass during the day, that's quite a good technique for that. And then moth trapping, so this is probably getting a bit off um, script, but you can go for this, the Rolls Royce of all moth traps, which is the Robinson uh, Vapor Mercury uh, trap. And you stuff egg, egg boxes inside the trap. The, Moths are attracted to this um, light bulb, which emits a lot of um, ultraviolet light, and they're attracted to that. And I do know of a collector who collect, put this out one night in a churchyard um, in northern France and collected so many moths that they actually didn't count the moths in there, but just weighed uh, the moth trap before and after. Or, yeah, once they'd emptied it of um, moths. You get lots and lots come to this light trap. There are others. This is a slightly cheaper version, which is um, a heath moth trap, and that attracts about 80% of the trap I showed before. Or you can do this, a sheep with a lamp behind it, just to see what's in your meadow. This is Costa Rica <laughs> and not Hereford. Um, you'll get probably a far fewer and less amazing, but you'll get some interesting stuff turn up that you never realised occurred in your neighbourhood. And then a couple of books to get started with. So the bee book, I think, is really excellent. Um, the Hoverflies, I just haven't had time to devote myself to it. But it's a, it's a nice book. And I'm sure people from Bug Life will recommend other books. But I found the Field Guide to Bees, so it's all the solitary bees. Um, it's been really good, really easy to identify lots of the stuff in there. <clears throat> and I'll end on that, if that's OK with everyone. This is, again, part of that tracking study room getting bees to get used to coming to a sugar feeder so we could put our transmitter tags on them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Fantastic. Lots and lots to think about. That's so, um, it's been really interesting to, to hear, um, hear what you um, proposed there and all of your ideas and the science behind things. So thank you very much. Rory, we've got a few more questions. Shall we just put them to Paul quickly because we are um, we haven't got that much time then maybe we can ask a few people to you. Yeah, um, so one very uh, short one from Barry Noble um, about whether ryegrass is used by brown butterflies. 
Uh, I haven't, I don't see meadow browns flying above ryegrass. Perennial ryegrass. Mm. Um, I don't see it. They may do. But I've never seen, lot, you know, a perennial ryegrass sward and lots of meadow browns. You tend to find them flying along the edges and probably mm. laying their eggs on a diversity. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's mm. not a big attraction. Um, and then an interesting one for Mariel, which um, uh, I think quite a few of us probably um, have asked uh, occasionally, is the impact of, of the hay cut on insects. Mm -hmm. um, so whether you cut your meadow for hay, and um, so what happens to all the invertebrate population? It's quite a destructive activity when you cut them in one go. How do you? How can you mitigate that? Or is there just no way of really? Well, you can cut late, can't you? You could mm. cut at the end of August. I mean, most of the action of the summer is ended by um, end of July. I mean, there is stuff still going on, and there are life cycles. I admit, but if you think of a meadow brown uh, larva and you've cut them. The hay meadow, that larvae will drop to the floor um, and feed on the basal sort of um, petals of or grass of um, its desire, desired species of grass. So yeah, I mean it's not going to be without um, victims, but you know it seems to work year in year out. You don't need to save each and every individual. Mm. So yeah, it shouldn't sort of. If, if possible, in patches or something, or greys as an alternative, or it's obviously not feasible on, on a lot of sites. Because I don't think you should worry about it. You've just, um, you know, you've just managed a two hectare wildflower meadow. Mm. Um, you know, it may not be perfect, but if you, if you left it to go rank each year, it would no longer be a wildflower meadow. Mm -mm -mm. And so, we're, talking about, we're talking about common species here as well. Um, you don't eradicate that species by cutting your hay meadow. You can do, some people in our group, Paul, have try, um, leave um, strips around the edge of the field that really? they uncut. Yeah, yeah. And then when the stock come in to do the aftermath, they will mob into there, be delighted to go munching in the hedge, perhaps if they're the sort of breeds yeah, of animals that do idea. that. And then, so you have left something, it's not 100%, um, yes. so that can be an important thing to, to think about as well. Yeah. I mean, if you get something rare turns up, then you need to really, um, you know, have a deep think about what you're going to do. Yeah. Um, if you get the Duke of Burgundy fertility turning up, then you're just going to have everybody on your doorstep telling you yeah. how to manage it. Yeah. Anyway. Um, um, question from Maya. Uh, this is <coughs> habitat connectivity. Um, asking how far can bees or other pollinators fly between habitats and therefore sort of how how close do meadows need to be? Honey bees forage about one and a half miles um, just in their daily life, which is why with beekeepers there's this three, three yards or three mile rule. You can even move your beehives less than three, sorry, three feet or three miles, less than three feet because you move it any further they can't find their way back, or more than three miles because they can never get back to what was their original habitat with only fly one and a half miles. Um, but there are lots of insects that migrate, uh, old females, um, you know, the reason that um, habitats get colonized suddenly by these uh, certain species of butterfly is because old females um, that still have eggs in them drift and get blown by the wind uh, and can turn up a long way from where they, they started their life. Um, so I don't know, 10 miles maybe, you know, if they can, and then the migrants, well, you know, they, give me a number, fly as far as you like, clouded yellows, and well, painted ladies in North Africa every year, so they already do that, um, red apples the same, clouded yellows, so yeah, they can fly a long, long way, but it's the habitat quality and type that is going to determine whether they turn up and colonise on the meadow. 